Uh, like you said, my name's Paul Baylor. That's my Twitter and email up there. If you have any questions after tonight or whatever, just want to get a hold of me, uh, those are the best ways. And I do this for the Twitter followers, so please. Uh, <laughs> a little bit about myself. Uh, I'm an application architect at IGS Energy, which means I'm loud and opinionated. Uh, I like Voltron, cats, and I'm, I'm pretty awesome. So, uh, all right. So this is the obligatory, if you only take away one thing from tonight's presentation, make it this slide. Uh, at this URL, you can find all of Apple's resources on Swift. Scroll down to the bottom, there's a lot of marketing uh, mumbo jumbo as well. Uh, all right, so what is Swift anyway? All right, well, it's not this Swift. That's a joke. <laughs> uh, all right. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Yeah, I'm informal, so if you have a question or something, just throw it out there. Uh, all right, I'm going to read you this little bit of marketing blurbage from Apple about Swift, uh, but I think it kind of covers the, the key points here. Swift is an innovative new programming language for Cocoa and Cocoa Touch. Writing code is interactive and fun. The syntax is concise yet expressive, and apps run lightning fast. All right, so let's just level set here. Who here has never written a line of code in their life? Yeah, a few people. All right, anyone here do Objective-C? All right, you're going to like the end of this a lot better than the beginning, I guarantee you. Uh, OK. So Objective-C was, I guess still is, the primary language for writing applications against iOS and Mac OS X. Uh, like it sounds, Objective-C is based off C with pointers and everything like that, right? It's getting a little long in the tooth. It's getting kind of gross. And Apple decided a couple years ago they needed to start working on a new, modern programming language. But they have all these frameworks, Cocoa for the Mac and Cocoa Touch for iOS. And they needed a language to leverage these libraries as well. So they invented Swift. All right. So how are we going to learn Swift today? Well, Swift is one of those languages kind of like Java and C Sharp where it's hard to separate the language from the underlying frameworks. So I think most of you are here to see some code. So we're going to build ourselves an application. Right? So yeah, this is it. No more slides. Uh, so what we're going to build is what I call an enterprise magic eight ball app. <laughs> All right, so what is an enterprise magic eight ball app? What is an enterprise magic eight ball app, you ask? Good question. Uh, it's going to be ugly, and it's going to call a web service. <laughs> <laughs> Something like that. Uh, after we go through the app, uh, this will be more, after the app will be more fun for the guys into Objective-C. We're going to fire up a Swift playground and show you some of the new language features as well. Uh, but for now, let's build an app. And I'm warning you, I have this head cold. So if I start sneezing, I apologize in advance. Really, no more slides. I'm going to close Keynote. All right, so here we have Xcode. Xcode is the integrated development environment used for building applications for iOS and Mac OS X. We're going to build ourselves an iOS app. Now, we can pretend here that I kind of have a solution skeleton, and all it has is our wonderful designer, uh, our enterprise designer, has given us our user interface laid out. Because honestly, I could do this here for you guys, but it's really boring <laughs> watching me lay out all the, the stuff. But I kind of want to show you what's going on here. What I am, I'm in main.storyboard. And a storyboard is exactly what it sounds like, just like if you were laying out a movie or a TV show. It's all the panels, all of the views in our application. And you can see here we have three. We have a navigation controller, which is simply just going to give us the forward and back functionality inside of our app. We have a very attractive user interface. This is ask your question. It's got a button. And we have a view that's going to display our answer. All right, so if I run this right now, you can see. Let's make that a little bigger. Come on. Too big. All right. So the amp launches, but it doesn't do anything. All right, so let's, the first thing we're going to do is make this push me button go to our answer page. All right, simple task, we hope. So we're going to start seeing our first intro to Swift. So 
iOS uses a very common pattern these days, model view controller. All right, so the people nodding their heads, yeah, you get what that is. So essentially what that is, it separates our presentation from the code that controls the, uh, well, the controller, that controls our view. So here, we have our view, our view part, and we're going to create a controller. So we're going to say new file, make sure we have iOS Coco Touch class, and we're going to call this question view controller. All right, so here, here's our first introduction to what Swift looks like. You can see it's very C-based, right? We've got curly braces, yay. Semicolons are optional, and they're pretty much deferred, preferred not to be there. That's kind of the style that Swift developers have decided upon. Uh, a lot of the syntax is optional, as you'll see. Uh, let's start with this first line here. Class, question view controller, colon, UI view controller. In Swift, anytime you see the colon, you can kind of think of the two words of type. So we're saying question view controller of type UI view controller. Now some of you must be wondering, why is that UI on the front of there? So remember, we used to use a language called Objective-C, which is based, in, based off of C, and C has no notion of packages or namespaces or anything like that. So if you had a class called foo and I had a class called foo, we could not use them together. So what would happen is you would say, uh, you would call yours uh, AA foo for awesome audience, and I would call mine AH for amazing host foo, and then we could use AA foo and AH foo uh, together. So first thing we need, we're going to declare a variable. We're just going to call this button. Then we'll call it the button. That sounds much more official. Of type UI button. And we're going to create a function by using the func keyword, handle the button tap. And that's where we're going to write our code when we tap the button. So we're just going to say self the button. We're going to add a target. In some languages, you use the word this to mean the object you're referring to in Swift itself. Handle the button tap. So UI control events is an enumeration. We're going to say touch up inside. Now, if I try to build this right now, right, it's going gonna, it's gonna to blow up all over the place. This kind of points out the most interesting thing about Swift, and it's how it handles null values, or in Swift we say nil. By default, Every object or variable you declare cannot be nil, ever. Never, ever, never, ever, never, ever. If you want an object to ever be nil, you have to opt into it by adding a question mark onto the end of it. That makes it an optional. At some point, the button may be there, it may not. And by doing that, it forces you to deal with that fact every single time you use that variable. And there's three ways to do that. We can go here to self dot the button and put an exclamation point or bang. And what that's telling the compiler is, hey buddy, I got this. I know that object's not going to be nil right there. It's, not, it's going to be set to an instance of an object. Go ahead and call the add target function on it. I got this. And if for some reason the button is null or nil, it's going to blow up. Crash. Application gone. You can put a question mark or question mark. What that's saying is, hey, Mr. Compiler, at this point, if the button happens to have a value, go ahead and call that method on it. If it's null, just ignore it. Skip it. Go on with your life. Don't do anything. And the third object is we can check. So we can, what's called unwrapping the variable, by saying if let button equals self dot button, and then calling btn dot boom. And if we want to do something else here, you could. 
print line. Woo! So that kind of gives you your first introduction to the oddities of what makes Swift a unique language. Now if I build this, it's going to say, oh, yes, it's the button. That's much more official sounding. Let's build that. Yay. So now we also need a way to kind of wire these two pieces together. Uh, let declares, in this case, so essentially what we're doing is we're declaring a variable here, right? Uh, you're kind of jumping ahead, but that's all right. No, no, it's fine. There are two keywords used for declaring variables in Swift. One is var that we've used up here, and the other one is let. Vars are actually variables. They can change. Lets are constants. They cannot change. In this particular case, the let kind of acts special because we're unwrapping that optional type. Uh, we'll see it used more in the general case here in a little bit. Pardon? Yeah, let is immutable, yes. Technically, the pointer is immutable, right? I could point it at an object, and that object could change, but I could never change where that object pointed to. All right. It's really great for constants, magic strings, that kind of stuff. My default is I kind of just use let by default, and then when the compiler yells at me, <laughs> I go back and see what I was doing and switch it to var, uh, and which happens more often than you think. So we need a way to associate our button, the button, with the button on the view. So to do that, we're going to go back to our user interface. Ah, first things first. almost forgot. We're going to put a magic declaration called IB Outlet on this sucker. So things that start with our fun little out sign are kind of instructions to the integrated development environment, the Xcode itself. This is basically saying, hey, we're going to wire this up to a UI widget. So this here, where I see my UI, is Interface Builder, the IB of IB Outlet. So the first thing we'll do, oh, that's not what I wanted, is we're going to associate our controller, say question view controller. So now our view knows it's associated to that view controller. And if I click over here on this magical little arrow, you can see the button has showed up. Let's zoom in on that. And then I can take this little dot and drag it to the button, and bam. Yeah, isn't that pretty cool? And that's just to show that it works. I'll just put a very simple print line statement here tap the button. If I click in the gutter, that's going to set a breakpoint. I can hit Command R to run the application inside the simulator. Push me, and boom, right? We're printing out to the console, almost. Let's flip over this. Tap the button, right? Very exciting. This is a good time to clap. Yeah, yeah. All right, let's stop that. But we don't want to print out to the console, right? That's, that's not nearly enterprising enough. What we want is to display this view. So we can kind of click on this arrow, right? And note that it says, this is a storyboard segue, right? Just what you would imagine. It's a transition between one view on our storyboard and the other. And it's got a name, show answer. Well, wouldn't it be handy if our view controller had a way to navigate that segue? Hey, look at us. So another interesting, interesting thing I want to point here. Our second parameter they're passing to the function has to be labeled. Everything but the first. You can see the same thing here with button, add target, self, action, handle the button tap, four control events, right? Our second, third, fourth, and arguments have to be labeled. I can say this is for readability, but really, if you get into Objective-C, you kind of know, you understand selectors, how that works. This is basically calling the select, yeah, if you know Objective-C, you know what I'm talking about here, right? But it kind of makes a very verbose, very readable 
uh, application. All right, so let's run this again now. And we should see, yay, our second view showing up. And because of our navigation controller, we get this very handy back functionality. Remember, this is over-engineered because it's an enterprise Magic 8-Ball app, right? We really don't need two views, but that's what our specification said, and that's what we're building. All right, we're going to drink water. So now for the fun part, making our answer appear. Well, we know, right, we've got this wonderful spinner in this label, and I assume the label's for our answer, right? So we want to display this spinner while we're calling our service, then make it disappear and show our answer. So, much like before, we're going to create a new file, Coco Touch, Answer View Controller. We're going to declare our two outlet var answer label. It's a label E. <laughs> the spinner happens to be of type I UI activity indicator view, which is a really long way of saying spinner. <laughs> Let's go back to Interface Builder, much like we did before. We'll select up here. Oh, wrong one. Come on. Answer view controller. Click on our... What? Okay. So... The compiler doesn't know about how I've wired up Interface Builder, right? It doesn't know, it don't care. So as far as the compilers, the, far as the, compi the question was, why is my spinner nullable? As far as the compiler's concerned, I'm not setting it. Something else must be setting it. So it has to, it's not being initialized when I'm creating the class, so it has to be a nullable. I have to deal with the whole optional syntax, either unwrap it. Yeah, much like Kim, if you have a question, just spit it out. So the first thing we'll do, there's a couple of overrides for view controller that we're going to deal with. View did load gets called when the UI has kind of been loaded from disk, but not yet displayed to the user. So we use this opportunity to say self.answer label. I'm going to go ahead and use the bang syntax, because I know I set up an interface builder. We'll <laughs> clear the text. And we'll make sure that the spinner is spinning. We will also do view did appear. Right? So what's going to happen is our user interface is going to appear. We're going to clear the label. We're going to make sure the spinner is spinning. Then we're going to call our web service to get our magic eight ball answer. So we looked in the documentation. We figured out the way to make kind of HTTP request in iOS is an object called NSURL session. So the first thing we'll do, and here I'm using let, right? I'm going to have a URL, and that sucker is never going to change. So I'm creating a new instance of NSURL. If this was a real production app, I wouldn't hard code localhost 8080 in my file, <laughs> right? But, nah. Now, just to point out, if I did this, actually, this is going to blow up for another reason. All right, yeah, so there, it's there since I try to reassign URL, cannot assign to let value URL, right? So it's letting me know that, hey, I'm trying to change a variable that I declared with the word let. And actually, that wasn't supposed to happen. Okay, that's <laughs> fine. That's fine. We're, we're, we're going to roll with it. So they released a new version of Swift and Xcode like last night. <laughs> and uh, I was an idiot and installed it this morning. <laughs> so uh, there's actually a new language feature that I thought I was going to hit here. And apparently, I'm not. So I'm just going to roll with it. <laughs> Yeah. 
Now here, I'm going to call the shared session method on NSURL session. And what that does, it kind of gives us a shared, think of it as a web browser, right? Anything that uses that shared session in my app is going to share HTTP cache, it's going to share cookies, uh, things like that, even though this is my only request. All right, so we're going to call data task. Let's get rid of that from our room. So we're going to pass the URL. Now that's an interesting gloobly gluck of uh, bangs and rainbows. So what that's actually asking me for is a function. It's saying completion handler must completion handler must be handed a function or a closure. Right, so for those of you who are dot, like programming stuff, closures, inline functions, lambdas, that kind of stuff, that takes an NS data, an NS URL response, and an NS error object. So we can give it one of those just by putting a bunch of curlies right there. Right, that's our syntax for a closure. Right, this is, oh, my wonderful presenter tag just fell off. How embarrassing. You're going to cut that out, right? <laughs> All right, so we'll say data, NS data, response, NS URL response, and error, NS error. So here I'm declaring that my function takes these three parameters the data. NS data represents our data in a binary format. That's going to be the raw response coming off of our web server. The response, if you want to look for status codes and things like that, you can get that off the response object. And if there was a problem, there might not be a problem, so it's optional. It's nullable. And to separate that from the code, we use the word in. So that kind of separates our argument list from the body. Yeah, it's, yes, exactly. It's, it's a closure, so I have access to everything that I, I normally would, so I can just type self right in here, you know, and do fun stuff with my answer label. All right. Can I just ask Yeah, hit me. What other languages are left? What other languages are left? Is it just I don't know the answer to that question. I think, basic. I think like like basic, basic, like yeah. pre-visual, basic, basic. Yeah. Use yes, basic. yes, with line numbers, right? Yeah. <laughs> I got gray hair. I know what's going on. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm I'm really 18. <laughs> All right. So the first thing we're gonna do. Not ns string. There we go. Is we're going to convert our data, not data and code entry. Thank you very much. UTF, let's see, is it UTF8? NS, UTF, there it is. I knew I remember it one of these days. So all this line's going to do is turn our binary data, binary response, into a string. So here, another interesting feature of Swift, I'm able, inside of a string, using this slash open parenthesis, or like call them rainbows, uh, and pull variables out in the same scope and print them right inside the string. So I don't have to combine strings together or do ns string with format, whatever that horrible selector is for those of you who know Objective C. All right. So here, I'm going to do something kind of naive to kind of walk you through a problem. I'm just going to go and say, well, I got my answer. I'm going to say self.answerLabel.text equals answer. And I'm going to stop the spinner. Stop animating. All right. So I'm going to set a breakpoint here. Oh, I got to do one more thing. I got to tell the task to actually go. And I do that by calling resume on it. 
Build failed. Extra argument. Completion handler. Yeah, we'll make you go away. Extra argument. I wish I could read the rest of you. Let's grab this and see what I did wrong. See, every demo, I practiced this, practiced this 8,000 times, and always something new comes up. <laughs> yeah, tell me about it. All right, let's get my IntelliSense back. URL. Yeah, we're going to do it this way. Oh, too many braces. Extra argument in call. I call shenanigans. Hold on, I wonder. Oh, here we go. I know why. All right. Yay. All right, this also kind of points out an interesting aspect. Before I had completion handler colon, if the last argument in your method call happens to be a closure, you can, you can just close the method and open the curly brace to kind of make it look more like control program flow. It's kind of just syntact syntactic sugar. Uh, but it makes it for some really interesting looking code, which if we have time, I'll show you some interesting stuff you can do with that. All right, so I'm going to set a breakpoint here and run this. All right, push me. All right, so we got a response back from our server. We got an answer. The answer was optional yes. We'll kind of explain that here in a little bit, too. And I'm going to try to update my answer label and my spinner. But as you can see here, it didn't do anything. Does anybody have any idea why this didn't do a dang thing? Anybody? Bueller? All right. So we're calling our HTTP request on a separate thread to keep the UI thread active. Our completion handler is being called on that same background thread. And iOS says, <laughs> <laughs> Probably. All right. Well, that's neat. Oh, well, let's do let's do it the right way anyway. How about that? Let's make it let's make it feel zippy. Hey, I know that guy. All right. So what we're going to do is we're going to take these two lines of code and force them to run in the main UI thread. So what we're going to use, rather than some really archaic grand satchel dispatch C interop, we're going to use operation queues. So an operation queue is just an abstraction over top of a thread. And in particular, we want the main queue. The main queue represents the main UI thread. We'll create an operation and my tabs are all askew. That's going to bug me. All right. So now, in theory, this should update. Oh, breakpoint's still there. Bacon, that's a great answer, right? Bacon's always a good answer. <laughs> good. Now, we are dealing with enterprise systems right here. So this terminal is kind of hosting my web server, right? It's, it's the ugliest of ugliest node apps you'll ever see in your life. I wrote it in literally 30 seconds. What happens if we just close that and stop it? And we go back here, and we run it, and we say, push me, 
and the spinner goes away, but I don't have any answer, right? That's gross. <laughs> so back over here, you see we get this optional error object, right? So we know how to deal with optionals, right? We've seen this before. We can look to see if that optional error was set and give a very nice enterprise error message to the user. And that's what we're going to do. So in our operation that's firing on the main thread, I can do if let error equals error. So that's going to return true if there is an error. So otherwise, we're going to do this stuff. So if we get an error, we're going to display a, a alert to the user, kind of like a, just a standard JavaScript dialog box. And you can imagine there's a alert view, or alert controller class just for that. We'll give it the title of boom. <laughs> the message will use localized description. That's going to give us a super user unfriendly error message. And that's exactly what we want for our enterprise <laughs> app, right? <laughs> <laughs> UI alert, UI alert controller style dot. Now, alert controller can come in two varieties. The first one is an alert. That's your typical just modal dialog box. Or you can ask it to be an action sheet, which if you've seen iOS, all those buttons that come up from the bottom, right? In this case, we just want a good old standard alert. But nothing comes for free, so we have to give it a done button as well. So we're created an alert action. Done. UI alert. Helps if I can type. Action style dot default. Now, we've, we recognize this syntax, right? It wants us to pass a function into it that gets called when someone presses that done button. I really don't care what it does, so I'm just going to create a very boring, helps if I don't hit the caps lock key. Alert dot add action done. And where did my telesense go? And then we will ask our current view, our current view controller. That's hard to say. To present our alert, animated. You betcha. <laughs> Animations for free. So if we run this again, it built. Push me. Boom. NS URL error domain error negative one thousand and four. <laughs> Yeah, that's English. So that will fire it back up just to show you one last time. The application in its glorious entirety. Come on. All right. No is our answer. Let's go back. Let's get another answer. Maybe. Perfect. Just like a magic eight ball. Totally useless answers. All right. So in 35 minutes, you went from knowing nothing about Swift to seeing an application built on it, right? Now, we didn't touch on all the language features here, but I kind of I want to give you an introduction for people who have never seen what building an iOS app looks like, what that kind of feels like. Uh, you know, Xcode, it's not a visual studio, you know, but it's, it's an eclipse, right? It's, <laughs> right? it's a sturdy workhorse. It does the job. So what I want to show now, yes, I do want to stop this task. I'm going to reopen up Xcode. Instead of opening a project, I'm going to say get started with the playground. So playgrounds are a new feature of Xcode 6 and Swift that allows you to write code without needing a whole project around it. Right, it's just a way for you to go through and noodle and do stuff. So you can see here, we have a string, hello playground. And it's evaluating it right as it goes and giving us the output, right? So that's kind of handy. So, right, we're all object-oriented developers here, right? Objects for the win. Uh, so let's do a very simple inheritance example. So we're going to declare a class called animal. Yeah. 
we want a constructor for this animal that takes the sound that animal is going to make. Constructors in Swift are declared with the init keyword. I can say sound of type string. Remember that colon means let sound string. Now here's a case we're actually using let make sense, right? That sound is going to be a property that's exposed on this object, but by saying let, I basically say no one can change it. It's going to be specified when the object was created and can never, ever, ever be changed again. If I wanted it to be changed, if I suddenly wanted, you know, barking ducks madness, I could say var. Funk, make noise, <laughs> and make noise will simply just write to the console. The sound was self.sound. Very exciting. I can make a dog of type animal, animal, init. So if I want to call my super classes constructor, I can just type the word super, say init, and sound woof. I know, exciting. Let my dog equal new dog, and we'll say my dog dot make noise. So you can see what it actually did. Since the print line was up here, that's where it wrote it out. If I want to see kind of more of a console version, I can click this little plus and then watch as the UI just barfs all over itself. <laughs> Handy feature. <laughs> Happens every time and it's never less shocking. <laughs> Especially with Apple's attention to detail, you think they would pick that one up, but no, you click that thing and it just goes, meh. <laughs> yeah. So you can see here, here's my console output, the sound was woof. Just to prove that inheritance really does work. Oh, a duck dot make noise, right? So the sound was quackers. Now, you see that I'm not really putting any kind of type information here, but all of my variables are strongly typed. So I actually couldn't do this. My dog, I can't take the variable that holds my dog and assign it to a duck, right? It looks kind of loosely typed, but Swift is strongly typed for the win, whether you like it or not. So these two lines are equivalent. My variable dog of type dog equals new dog. But since that looks gross, we can just do this. Now, if I did want to have kind of that polymorphic behavior and not know what type, I could say what of type animal is equal to a dog. And then I could do what equals a duck after the fact. And everything is just, as long as I don't redeclare it. And it'd be perfectly happy. All right, so that's kind of classes and inheritance. Start watching the time here. You guys could get, gotta, gotta be getting hungry. So, Let's look at something we all deal with, lists, right, arrays. My numbers, to declare an array, you just open up your robot arms. I'm just gonna put a bunch of numbers in here, 15, 12, 11, that all works. Now, like most good modern languages these days, Swift tries to be everything to everyone and have a lot of functional programming kind of stuff built into it as well. So we can do my numbers dot sort. 
And what it's asking for here is what we've seen before. It's asking for a function. So we can do left-hand side, right-hand side, in. And I want to sort them descending. So I'm going to say return right-hand side is greater than left-hand side. And I'll just print line my numbers. Helps if I could type. Right? Oh, nope. I actually sorted them the way that I didn't want to sort them. We'll do that. How about that? Yay! <laughs> I, I always get those backwards. I don't know about you. <laughs> so let's say that we also wanted to do a quick transform on them, right? We can say, my, now sort sorts the objects in line. A lot of these other ones create copies of the array. So we're just going to copy them right back. We're going to say map, which takes a transform function. Now, if I want to be super lazy, and not have to declare this, I know that map's going to get called for every object in my, every item in my array, and I'm going to do something with it. I can kind of do, which looks really kind of Perl-like, I can just say dollar sign zero, right, say the first argument. <laughs> so this and this are equivalent code. So now all I've done is I've taken my array and added it, gone through, added one to every object in my array. Let's say that I only care about numbers that are greater than 10. I can say my numbers equals my numbers dot filter and say return percent or dollar sign zero is greater than or equal to 10. And now my arrays filter down to only those items. Make sense? Questions? You can get a return, I've seen sometimes it's greater than 10. You can. Actually, in this, that's also equivalent right there. By default, if you have a one line function, the return's implied. I don't know. It's, I don't know. This also feels kind of pearly to me, and that's <laughs> dangerous waters, right? <laughs> uh, or regular expression when you're doing you know, your, your capture groups. Uh, all right, I've got 15 minutes. Let's do something really fun. Let's say that I have an array of numbers again, because I like arrays of numbers. And I want to iterate over that array in a way that makes me feel like a Ruby programmer, right? Because I'm too good for loops. <laughs> right? So what we can do is we can write a function, func for each, that takes values of type interray. That's how we say in Swift, of type interay. You just put the type in there and put your robot arms around it. And I read all these evaluations to people, so remember that. <laughs> <laughs> So what we want to be able to do in this for each function is take a closure, a function, a lambda that's provided to us and call it for every item in, in our array. So to do that, and this, this syntax is just ugly. <laughs> call back colon. Yep. All right, so I'm going to finish this function just to get an idea of what we're actually doing here. For v in values, call back v. All right, so I'm going to stand up for this one. This is important. We're passing in our values, our array, and giving it a function. And what our for each does is actually do a for each in our item and call that function back. So you could say you could print these out, you can add one. What this hideous syntax here, callback of type, a function that takes as its parameter an integer and returns nothing. I know, <laughs> right? It, I think they're kind of cousins in a way, yeah. 
So we can say for each, my numbers, my numbers, and we'll just do a quick function here, and we'll just print line the number was do 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 int of type is not subtype of for each my numbers shenanigans let's do this will that make you happy the number was value that's because i told it to do that <laughs> all right so here we're saying for each my number passing in a function, the number was value, right? But what if I just didn't have, I wanted to do something similar, but I have strings. That's where it's going to get really deep for those of you who have never seen programming. <laughs> Swift supports generics. Yay, generics. So I can genericize this function by saying, hey, for each of some type, it takes an array of that type, and callback is a function that takes that type as its first argument and returns nothing. So I can do for each my string value in and print line. We'll just print out the value there. And soon the console will, oh, parenthesis. Oh, helps if I actually make that an array. That would be a lot more impressive. There we go. Hey, now. So that's pretty much Swift in a nutshell, people. Now you've seen all the major features. You've dealt with nullables, optionals, the like to call them. Uh, really doesn't get too more super exciting and starts until you start doing really, really deep interop with Objective-C, and that would just melt your brains. So unless there's any questions, I'm going to let you all free to drink. <laughs> 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 any questions? No questions at all. I don't believe it. All right. Real quick, uh, for people who have done Objective-C for a while, yeah. how, how do other Swift and Objective-C play together? Uh, like OK. So. When, if you say you created a brand new project and you said Swift, right, because I'm, I'm brave and I'm going to go full bore, and then, you know, you're firing up CocoaPods, right, and you're pulling in a third-party library and it's all Objective-C. What happens is that there's a special file created called my application underscore bridging headers, and it's a .h file. And there you import any Objective-C header file that you want to use and what it will do is it will parse a header file and Swiftify it for you. And then you can call it just like you had imported it in any of your Swift classes. It's actually pretty slick. Uh, there are a handful of things that it just gives up on and doesn't map over. So like especially things like uh, if you deal with like appearance manager, like appearance proxy in, contained when contained in, nope. <laughs> It just gives, it may, they may have fixed it in 6.1, but in 6.0, that kind of stuff just wasn't there. But it's getting better all the time. Uh, one thing to note, this, as of yesterday, Swift is version 1.1. Apple has said they will not be containing, they will not, 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 capital N, capital O, capital T, not be maintaining source compatibility in the future, but they will be maintaining binary compatibility. So they are taking... They're saying, we're going to change this language. It's brand new. You guys have had it for, what, six months now? It's going to evolve. It's going to change. Your code's going to break. Don't whine. <laughs> Want to talk about Tuffle? Pardon? Tuffle? Oh, no. <laughs> no. <sighs> uh, enums are interesting. Enums. So enums are declared with the enum keyword. We'll just call this, that's, now I'm off script. No. I know, I know. 
So I can say uh, var x equals foo dot one x equals now this is this is interesting once I've said x is of type why am I looking up there <laughs> is of type foo I no longer need to say foo anymore I can just do dot okay because it knows oh you're dealing with type foo and you can see for enums for some reason that escapes me Completely, they borrowed the switch statement kind of case labels. One really kind of interesting thing, all right, this is, a, I'm gonna steal this literally out of the documentation. Uh, let's say that we were, we had a schedule enumeration, on time and late. Let's see if I remember how to do this. Late, I think I just, if this doesn't work, int. All right. My bus equals schedule dot late, and I think it can say eight. <laughs> so I can tag values on to my enum. Right, you're thinking, that seems kind of weird. And to realize that they actually implemented most of Swift in Swift, and those optionals, those question marks that we dealt with, those are really just an enum with a case of like has value of, I think like, actually it would be probably generic. This may not compile, but. That's all optionals are. It's just an enumeration with a value and nil. That actually isn't complaining. <laughs> wow. So that's, I don't know the answer to that question. <laughs> <laughs> And that becomes really important when you notice one thing I didn't talk about at all, which is exceptions and errors, because Swift don't got them. <laughs> <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. You would want to return something, much how we saw in our method calling back from when we made our service, our wonderful service call, to get our magic eight ball answer. It gave us the data, the response, and optionally an error. That's the kind of pattern you see. Uh, let's see if we can figure that out. Raw value seven, how do we get? I have no idea. I skimmed it. You could read the documentation at your leisure. Remember that, remember that slide, apple.com slash Swift? <laughs> right? That's where you're gonna wanna go. And search for yeah. Uh, actually, that brings up a really good point. Uh, one thing I've always kind of liked about Apple and their development is their documentation is spectacular, right? They have really strong technical writers. They write really good documentation. And they wrote literally two books that they shipped when Swift first came out. One's just about the language, and one's about using it with Objective-C and kind of bridging that gap. If you're interested in Swift, I recommend it's a great place to start. The front, the front of that first book is very kind of exploratory. you will be using Playgrounds. you will be going along with it. And then the back of it's a reference, which is boring and stuffy. Nobody ever looks at that, unless you're, you know, right now. <laughs> uh, <coughs> documentation is really good. So uh, that's how I started. I just started reading the book. Any other questions? All right, I'm going to get five minutes of your life back before dinner starts. You might even get there a little early. Uh, thank you all for coming here. For those of you who voted for, the, for it, thanks for voting for me. Thanks for showing up. Yeah. 
Uh, you guys were great. Good questions. I appreciate it. That's it. That's a wrap. Thanks, guys. <laughs>